today we are shooting um, Hearth and Hand fall product in one of my favorite fixer-uppers. I wonder sometimes if we know ourselves a lot better than we think we do when we're children. We get into our teen years and college years and so many of us let others redefine who we are or we get lost along the way and have no idea what we really want to do with our lives. But once we finally figure it out, it often seems easy to look back into our childhoods and find a few clues that say, hey, maybe you were headed in that direction all along. For me, the entrepreneurial spirit was always there. During my young years in Wichita, Kansas, my mom worked at a little gift shop owned by one of her friends. After school, my two sisters and I would go there while she worked, and I would always play store. I would sit there and pretend that I was working the cash register. I would have my sisters bring stuff up to the counter, and I would wrap it up. I loved doing that. Even when we'd get home, I would set up my whole room like a store and then have fake customers come in. At one point, I had a set of Lee press-on nails, and I would make my sisters come in like customers to a spa. I was always thinking about ways to make money, so I would basically make my sisters pay me for whatever they were buying, even if it was only a dime. On the weekends, I made a habit of setting up these makeshift little carnivals in our backyard and charging neighborhood kids a dollar to get in. I'd have lemonade and rides, primarily just the swing set, and games. To swing on the swing set would cost you another dime, but I always wanted it to be this fun experience for everyone, so I'd work hard all week getting it set up. My sisters basically provided free labor for me, in addition to having to pay to get in. I'm not sure why they went along with it, seeing that I was the middle child, but they did. Home was the place where I asserted myself, and I wasn't shy about it the way I was in other places. I felt safe at home, and I felt like I could be me. I was also a creative kid, but not in terms of artistry or design or anything like that. I was just always pretending. I kept trying to invent wings so I could fly, or I would always try to come up with something that someone would buy. So I was always thinking. I remember playing a lot by myself. My older sister and my younger sister, when they weren't being my minions, were usually out playing with the neighborhood kids, but I could usually be found in a corner playing make-believe. I pretended different things at different phases of my childhood. For a while, I was always doing pretend commercials. So if I were eating breakfast, I would hold up the cereal box and say, Kellogg's. We make this nutritious. I would read it like a newscaster and pretend that I was on a commercial. Sometimes I'd do the same thing with a bottle of shampoo in the shower. No matter where I was, I would act out these commercials as if I had a real audience. That's another strange thing, considering what I'm doing now. Growing up, I sometimes felt like this audience of mine was always with me, watching me in my pretend store, watching me do some commercials. It was almost as if I was living in The Truman Show, that movie with Jim Carrey in which a character is filmed from the moment of birth and watched by millions as he goes through his daily life. Even if I was all by myself, I would look around and think, I know you're out there watching me. My parents remember hearing me talking to this unseen audience often when I was a little girl. They say I always swore I had a pet rabbit named Joe, but according to my parents, it was just make-believe. It was all the expression of a creative mind. Anyway, looking back, I can see there were a whole bunch of things in my childhood that pointed toward what I'd do in my adult life. And once I started doing it for real, I thrived. It seemed that the more opportunities I had to get creative and get entrepreneurial, the more fulfilled and energized I felt about life. Outside of the store, Chip and I kept most of our endeavors in our typical wheelhouse. We sank our money and time into 3rd Street, where Chip continued to be the honorary mayor as he continued to expand his rental and home building business. A big part of Chip's dream for that street began in a deal he made before we were married. Chip and his father went in on a deal together to purchase 11 acres of land just a few blocks from where we would live as newlyweds. Chip was convinced that the 3rd Street area would go up in value. Baylor University was only about a mile away just across LaSalle Avenue. And eventually, Chip believed that Baylor would run out of room to house its growing student population. Well, his intuition on that was right. A big out-of-town company came along and saw what Chip was doing with his few small rental houses in this mostly untouched area of Waco, and they made him an offer. A good offer on those 11 acres. Their plan was to build hundreds of units of dorm-style apartment homes on 3rd Street to market to the Baylor community. They were basically going to create a whole new neighborhood on the land Chip and his dad had been sitting on. Chip wasn't interested in selling all of the land off. He had big dreams of owning rental homes up and down 3rd Street, so he structured a deal that sold off the back part of the acreage to that big company, while he kept the acreage along the road frontage to split into small lots where he could eventually build some individual rental houses himself. 
Chip and his father made good money on that sale, and that allowed us to do some more investing, hire more help, and get started building some more little rental houses, basically sinking every penny that came into our long-term future. In our personal lives, we were still barely scraping by, but the business side of things was going well. In fact, we were seeing so much growth and progress on 3rd Street that there were times when we felt as if the whole neighborhood was ours. Only it wasn't. By this time, we had three dogs, Shiner, Maggie, and Blue, all rescue mutts. It was too crowded in an 800-square-foot house to have the dogs inside at all times, so we'd let those dogs out to roam around a bit. They were a lot like me and pretty much thought they owned the entire 3rd Street. I had this four-wheeler that I'd ride up and down the street with, just checking on everything, and those dogs would run right alongside me. They were some of the best dogs you've ever seen. They never bothered anyone, certainly never bit anyone, or even really came close. But we had this one neighbor across the street who just hated those dogs, and every single time she saw them off a leash, which was just about all the time, she would call the animal control. The people from the pound would show up, haul the dogs downtown in their van, and write us these tickets to in either Joe or I's name. There were times when the officer would literally call the dog right off the front porch, Come here, dogs! And they'd hop in the van, off they'd go, back for another stay at the pound. These were not like parking tickets either. They came with a heavy fine, which I absolutely refused to pay out of some kind of misguided principle. I never was much of a rule follower, and this put-your-dog-on-a-leash rule was no exception. If the dogs had been hurting somebody, I'd have certainly understood that. But to take them from my own front yard? Well, guess what? When you don't pay your fines, eventually the police come looking for you. We owed something like $2,500 in tickets, and we simply didn't have that kind of money lying around, even if we wanted to pay the fines, especially since I was about to have a baby. Sure enough, two weeks early, I delivered a beautiful, healthy baby boy that we named Drake. We named him after the New York hotel where we'd stayed on our honeymoon. So Drake was a week old and I was sitting in this house, feeding him in the back room, when I heard a knock on the door. Chip answered it. It was the police. Is Joanna Gaines here? We have a warrant here for her arrest, the officer said. It was the tickets. I knew it. And I panicked. I picked up my son and I hid in the closet. I literally didn't know what to do. I'd never even had a speeding ticket and all of a sudden I'm thinking, I'm about to go to prison and my child won't be able to eat. What is this kid going to do? I heard Chip say, she's not here, sir. Thankfully, Drake didn't make a peep, and the officer believed him. He said, well, just let her know we're looking for her, and they left. Joe is the most conservative girl in the world. She's never even been late for school. I mean, this girl was straight-laced. So now we realize this citywide warrant is out for her arrest, and we're like, oh, crap. In her defense, Joe had wanted to pay the tickets all along, and I was the one saying, no way, I'm not paying these tickets. So we decided to try to make it right. We called the judge and the court clerk told us, okay, you've got an appointment at three in the afternoon to discuss these tickets. See you then. We wanted to ask the judge if he could remove a few of them for us. The fines for these dogs running at large on our front porch just seemed to be really excessive. As I was designing the new fall collection, I wanted to create pieces that would inspire a warm autumn get together with family and friends. You'll find beautiful wood chargers, cutting boards, and unique reactive glaze serveware as well as seasonal linens for the table. These authentic cast iron pots, bowls, and condiment caddy are versatile enough to serve outdoors and beautiful enough to double as decor inside. Shop our new Hearth and Hand with Magnolia Fall Collection 